I'm James Bayes at United Nations headquarters. Year after year, when world leaders gather here in New York, they use their annual meeting to call for a form of this body, the Security Council. So why is that demand constantly ignored? You're watching Inside Story. Hello and welcome to a special edition of our programme. This is the horseshoe table of the Security Council where the 15 ambassadors sit. In international law, this is supposed to be the place where the final decisions on global conflicts are made. Yet in Syria, over the last two and a half years, over 100,000 people have died and this council has remained deadlocked. In this programme, we ask whether the whole system is broken and whether the Security Council should be reformed. For 60 years, this is where world leaders made their speeches. The words of figures like Kennedy, Khrushchev, Castro, Reagan, Arafat, Gaddafi and Mandela were all heard in this room. Now it's closed for renovation. This is the temporary building where this year's meeting will take place, a conference room converted into a UN chamber, where once again there are likely to be calls not just for the modernization of UN buildings, but of the whole system. When the United Nations was first set up in the immediate aftermath of World War II, the main decisive power was given to the UN Security Council. It has 15 members, but only five of them are permanent. Only five have the veto. Those five are the countries that were on the winning side when the war ended. The world should be dynamic. Things are changing and we should rise to the occasion. The system that was developed at the time was a good one, but over the years things have changed and those realities should be incorporated. The UN system works when the five major powers are in agreement, but when they disagree there is deadlock. For two and a half years there's been no progress at all on Syria, while over 100,000 people have died. Observers say it shows all the flaws that exist in the system. One of those voices is a former UK diplomat who now advises the Syrian opposition. One of the very odd things that I experienced when I was on the council was that the one group of people you could guarantee would not be consulted on what was being discussed in the Security Council were the people most affected. So, you know, whether it's Iraqis, Kosovars, Sudanese or Syrians, you know, their representatives, their legitimate representatives, would never get a chance to have a say on what they thought the council, what the world should do. Oh. <laughs> world leaders are all arriving in New York. There will again be much talk of reform of the UN system, but there's very little chance of progress on what so many say are much needed changes. Joining us now to discuss the issue of Security Council reform here in the Garden of the United Nations, we're joined by a distinguished panel of ambassadors. We have the Ambassador of Norway, Gea Pedersen, the Acting Ambassador of Brazil, Regina Dunlop, and the Ambassador of Pakistan, Masood Khan, who is also currently one of the members of the Security Council. We heard about the history there, a system that was set up after World War II, before your country was even created, is this the right system for the world of the future? No, the system has to be reformed. Uh, in 1945, it was a different world. You have a new international order. Things have changed. Uh, imperatives for peace and security have changed. Unfortunately, reform so far has focused only on increase of permanent or non-permanent seats, particularly in the contemporary context. But I think we need a much more comprehensive reform. Ambassador Pedersen, the Security Council chamber was recently renovated by the Norwegians. The General Assembly is currently being renovated. Should the system be renovated? Yes, definitely. I very much agree with uh, my Pakistani friend that the system is uh, no longer capable of delivering what we need. We need to see that uh, it is increased with its legitimacy and we need also to see a more effective system. Uh, we saw in the Syrian crisis that uh, the Security Council could not deliver. So I think nobody should be on the table of everyone. 
this is a very serious issue that we all should take as perhaps of a first priority. We seem to have agreement. Ambassador Dunlop, the victors of World War II, having a veto on the events of today. Is that right? Well, the veto is something that uh, will have to be discussed thoroughly and deeply and uh, it will be, um, you know, part of the reform, but uh, there could be initial steps before the discussion of the veto. Uh, it's widely realized that uh, international realities have uh, undergone profound changes in the last two decades, uh, adding new and increasingly complex challenges uh, to world governance. Uh, as embodied in the United Nations institutional architecture. So the capacity of the organization to satisfactorily meet these new demands um, uh, has to be, uh, it has not evolved uh, with the speed and in the direction of the, the, you know, the world dynamics. I think uh, we have to think thoroughly about this reform. And you have to take into account various factors, don't you, Ambassador Khan? For example, who is actually doing the work on the ground? Which countries are providing the peacekeepers? You look at a current list and Pakistan has 7,599 troops out there. Behind it, India, Ethiopia and Bangladesh providing troops to the United Nations. Should that be taken into account? I think that, that should be taken into account and uh, that is a requirement of the Charter <coughs> as well. Uh, you mentioned the number of troops uh, right now which are being contributed by Pakistan. I can tell you that uh, we started contributing troops to the United Nations peacekeeping in 1960 um, and in the past 53 years we have contributed more than 150,000 troops to the United Nations peacekeeping and we are the largest uh, troop contributor out of 114 which have contributed uh, to the United Nations peacekeeping effort. But let me tell you that uh, in the context of Security Council reform, uh, multiple criteria are being uh, evolved, developed, discussed. Um, and I think that uh, we have to look at them objectively. Some countries say that they, are, uh, they have large size, others say they have large population. There are others who say that they have strong, robust economies. There are some other countries who are saying that they have made contribution to peacekeeping, peace building, or peacemaking. So I think that what we need is, I mean, this has been happening for, for uh, at least two decades. We have to go deeply into these issues and uh, develop a new criteria for a comprehensive reform of the Security Council. And I would say right now the debate is fixated on two issues, uh, increase in permanent seats and increase in non-permanent seats. There's a group which is called Uniting for Consensus. They're talking about medium-term seats. That's the group that you're a member of. Yes. Let's get it clear. Yes. Let me tell you that why did I bring it up? I brought it up because you need intermediate solutions and you need comprehensive reforms. And you do not address just one dimension of Security Council reform, which is related, I must say, to the reform of the entire United Nations. Ambassador Pedersen, one other factor, of course, is how much countries pay for all mm. of this. Norway is mm. a tiny country, but you pay more than your fair share, don't you? Well, I, th I think we should rather say it like this, that we are paying our fair share, but others should also contribute their fair share. Uh, today, I think we are the sixth, seventh biggest contributor to the United Nations. In our history, we have also contributed with peacekeepers. We actually, it's a small nation of five million people, but we have had more than 30,000 peacekeepers that have contributed. But why have we contributed so much? It is, of course, because we depend on the United Nations and we depend on an effective Security Council. Remember when the United Nations was established, 51 member states. Today, 193. We have had one reform of the Security Council that came about in 1965. In 1945, it was decided 11 members, then it was increased to 15. No, I think we all agree it needs to be increased. The difficult question is, as you rightly said, how do we do that? And I think we have to admit that uh, the discussion so far has really not taken us anywhere. Perhaps it's time that we all understand that our first priority will not be the one that actually we go through. We need to start looking at compromise. You three ambassadors are a distinguished panel. We don't, though, have a representative from the permanent members, those five that have the veto, the US, the UK, France, China and Russia. Perhaps, though, we have a glimpse 
into what one of those ambassadors once said and once thought about this. Samantha Power is now the US ambassador to the UN. Writing back in 2004, she said, permanent membership on the Security Council granted to the Second World War victors plus France is woefully anachronistic. The world's largest democracy, India, is excluded. So are regional powerhouses such as Nigeria and Brazil, not to mention the entire Islamic world. She goes on to say, it is the permanent members who decide when atrocities warrant humanitarian intervention. But this decision is made by two of the world's worst human rights abusers, Russia and China, and one country, the United States, that exempts itself from most international human rights treaties. You know Ambassador Power very well. Ambassador Khan, you sit on the Security Council. I don't think she's going to be repeating those words anytime soon, is she? Well, I agree with her about the anachronistic bit. I mean, what the structure of the Security Council and uh, of the entire United Nations, as a matter of fact. I mean, this dates back to 1945 and its immediate aftermath. So what I would like to say, I mean, I want to uh, state it very clearly and categorically. Uh, there should be, in this reform process, there should be no new centers of privilege. I think that it should be a just and equitable system. This system should aggregate the interests and aspirations of the entire membership of the United Nations, not just a privileged few. So, I mean, if the push for reform is to perpetuate which was done in 1945, then this would again be anachronistic. But if you're forward looking, you have to hear the voices, not only from the powerful countries or middle level countries, but also from smaller states, what they have to say. And as it was mentioned by the ambassador of Norway, you also have to see who has made contributions, whether these are fin financial contributions or contributions in terms of uh, uh, economic strengthening of the global system or uh, peacekeeping troops. So I think that you have to take into account all these dimensions. Well, let's bring up the specific point right now that is dividing the Security Council, deadlock on the Security Council, Ambassador Pedersen, on the issue of Syria. This is shameful, isn't it? Yes, I do believe that's the right expression. It's shameful, even disgraceful, and I'm sure we all here agree on that. The question is, of course, why did this happen? Two years ago, we know that there were only a few thousand that had actually been killed, not that many refugees. Today, we have more than four million displaced people, more than two million refugees. Uh, we see a lot of uh, problems in Lebanon. Why did we allow it to develop like this, that it has now actually become a real threat to peace and security? Obviously, big power politics has a lot to do with it, and I think also a non-functional national system. Uh, we came in also too late on humanitarian assistance. We are not really able... We, the UN, let me emphasize this, is doing a great job when it comes to humanitarian assistance. But still, we are not able to reach all the people in need. We know that in homes there are many thousands that have been locked for months. What should we do? What should be the answer to this? The answer should this, to this should be that the Security Council should unite behind the resolution that points towards a political transition in Syria. We know this, but nothing is happening. Ambassador Dunlop, no progress. Perhaps we can understand no progress on the politics and the military front, but no progress on the humanitarian front? Yes, I agree. Uh, in fact, uh, I was going to pick up uh, uh, exactly where uh, the ambassador of Norway uh, mentioned. I think this is very representative of a crisis in terms of representativeness and legitimacy. Uh, I think the two deaths that uh, uh, you know the Security Council uh, has at the moment, and uh, uh, you see. The perception that the authority of the Council is not uh, generating levels of trust uh, so that they can perform uh, their, uh, you know, a duty with effectiveness and efficiency, in a way, uh, is a consequence of this lack of representative, uh, representativeness. So if they are not representative of the membership, as Ambassador Khan mentioned, uh, there are bit doubts about, uh, you know, the, 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 the legitimacy of its decisions. And uh, I think, you know, what we see at the moment is exactly this polarization, because there should be countries 
that are centers of new centers of regional and international influence that can provide bridges between these two sides. And I would like to mention that Brazil was part of the Security Council 2010-2011, and the first substantive manifestation of the Council in 2011 was a presidential uh, statement that was in fact uh, negotiated by Brazil as one of these countries that can provide the bridge for understanding and construction of but consensus. But since then, not much progress, Ambassador Khan. World leaders are gathering here, including your Prime Minister, gathering here in New York for the General Assembly. A year ago, the official figures said 20,000 dead. Now it's over 100,000. A year ago, uh, there were some, well, there are now some 2 million refugees. That's 10 times what it was a year ago. You're on that Security Council. Should you hang your head in shame? No, I should not. And the Security Council should not. Let me tell you why. Um, you know, Security Council is the apex body for maintaining international peace and security. It has an impasse. Uh, this is a difficult situation that the Security Council finds itself in. But uh, for multilateral diplomacy, uh, this is the best vehicle uh, for delivery. It has not been able to deliver for the past two years. That's because of real politic, not because of any dysfunctional aspect of the Security Council itself. But let me tell you, because I, I, when I say that this is the best forum, uh, I compare it to any unilateral solutions or plurilateral solutions. Uh, uh, so let's uh, Like the US uphold. taking its own military action, for example. I would not give any instances, but I would say that we must uphold the legitimacy of the Security Council and the United Nations for collective action. But let me also tell you that the, uh, this body is doing uh, a great job, let's say in Africa, from uh, Somalia to Sudan, South Sudan, to Mali, to DRC, to Sierra Leone, it to Liberia. It does a great job when the great powers all agree, but when they don't, nothing happens. Absolutely. So that's where we should zero in. I, let me tell you that right now what is dividing the Security Council is, uh, uh, is, is the differences between the United States and Russian Federation on how to go about uh, Syria. And also this uh, logic that prevails within Syria, government and opposition believing that there's a military solution is possible. Uh, that is counterintuitive. We know all that, that you cannot uh, deliver peace through war. You can't d deliver diplomacy through military clashes and confrontation. Which, so We're sitting here in the garden yeah. of the United Nations, supposed to be a place of peace and harmony. World Peace Day took place uh, just uh, the other day. We're sitting by the peace bell here. Ambassador Pedersen, what happened to this idea that was supposed to be this overarching principle of a responsibility to protect people? I think that principle is stronger than it has been just a few years ago. But as Ambassador Khan mentioned, uh, the problem here is really big power politics and disagreements within Russia and the United States. And it raises also the issue about uh, the veto power. And obviously the veto power is a very complex issue, but perhaps we should have had a discussion about whether the veto should be used when it is an issue about responsibility to protect crime against humanity, war crimes, genocide. Perhaps uh, this is an issue where we could move forward and we could uh, try to force an agreement and that the international community should see that we, do, we can't really sit and watch more than 100,000 people killed, millions of refugees, one of the biggest disasters after World War II and the international community are not really capable of delivering a solution. Hopefully, of course, this week we will see new things in the Security Council on this particular subject. You're talking about chemical weapons and a possible vote, possible resolution on chemical weapons. Let's examine that with Ambassador Khan because he knows what's going on. He's on the Security Council. Have you been involved in any negotiations about this resolution or is it just those permanent five net members meeting discussing among themselves? Let me first uh, state very emphatically that we welcome the agreement which was reached between the United States and Russian Federation in Geneva. Uh, that provides a basis for securing uh, chemical weapons in Syria and destroying them. Uh, there would be uh, an OPCW 
uh, executive council decision which will come to the council we will have a resolution elements of a resolution are being discussed and are the third they being most discussed important. with you though this is i want to just I'll work out how I'll the decision making works is it not just the p5 discussing this and you're being used as a rubber i'll scout? come to that but there's one very important bit i mean when the decision is taken by the council uh, in the form of a resolution you will have to establish an elaborate mechanism so this is a uh, a uh, three-part or three-tier process which has to be completed. Now your question is whether or not elected members of the council were involved in this process. We have been involved directly and indirectly, uh, directly because there were briefings by the Secretary General and we had a um, consultation of the whole. Uh, That's many all times, of the Security Council, uh, all The 15. entire Security Council has been meeting and uh, our colleagues, Permanent Five, they've been briefing us from time to time on an informal basis, so we have been in the loop. But let me tell you that uh, the, this differentiation is a fact of life. Uh, there are permanent members of the Security Council and there are non-permanent members, members which are elected by, this, uh, by the General Assembly. Now, we need more cohesive council, particularly in times of crises. We need more consultations, more intense consultations, uh, and uh, uh, we hope that uh, when there's a decision, there's an agreement between the United States and Russian Federation on the interpretation of the agreement that we reached in Geneva, we hope that we will be able to evolve a decision um, that would, of course, uh, help us destroy chemical weapons, but also help us address more important questions, the wider question of bringing peace to Syria. It should not be uh, just... Um, restricted to the destruction of chemical weapons. Ambassador Dunlop, just looking at the deadlock here, you're advocating more permanent members of the Security Council. Wouldn't that just mean more inaction? No, not at all, because um, uh, if uh, you think that when the United Nations was created, there were only 51 members. Now we are 193. So the ratio then was one seat, permanent seat, for every 10 member states. Now it's one for 40. So the number uh, of countries that became part of the organization has fourfold. And we still have the same structure with the same characteristics without diversity and without proportionality. And the same applies to non-permanent members, which have had a limited increase in number in 1965. But again, the ratio is still far from what it was at the beginning. So something is disconnected. Ambassador Pedersen, these discussions have been going on for absolutely years. I know you're all diplomats, <laughs> but isn't it time for you who want change to stop being diplomatic, to start shouting about this? Uh, at least we need to change. Uh, I, I do not recommend sh shouting, but uh, we, we need to have discussions like we're having today. And I, I think, you know, for me, it's easy to say that, you know, I hear what I'm from Brazil, from Pakistan, and I can easily see that they make very sensible arguments. But I think if we are really to move forward, we need to concentrate on what can unite us. And we, then we have to realize that our first priority will not be the one thing that actually will be implemented. Well, Ambassador Khan, a final question to you. You're nearly finishing your time as a Security Council member. Do you honestly believe next time Pakistan has a seat on the Security Council there'll be a different system? Uh, I'm not in a position to predict, but I can tell you uh, it's my firm belief that this reform process should not lead to perpetuation or replication of historical inequities. I would say that we should use this time to make some important, momentous, incremental changes. This year, when Pakistan was the president of the Security Council, we revived the practice of a wrap-up session. What was the rationale? We wanted to uh, make the council uh, more accountable, more transparent, more interactive vis-a-vis -vis the General Assembly. And I think now, increasingly, a large number of uh, uh, non-council members are, part are witnessing the debate, that wrap-up session that we have. Similarly, we can take a series of measures to make it more effective, the Security Council more effective. My final argument would be that whatever the circumstances, whatever the objective conditions right now, we should try to make Security Council more responsive to the international crises. Because as you have rightly pointed out, in case of Syria, there's been an abysmal failure to respond quickly. 
Ambassador Khan of Pakistan, Ambassador Dunlop of Brazil and Ambassador Pedersen of Norway, thank you very much for joining us on this special edition of Inside Story from the Garden of the United Nations. Let's hope we do this again soon. This programme and many others can be watched if you go online to aljazeera.com. Bye for now.